Okay, so um, I am trying this out. Um, we're gonna see if it works and if you can hear me, hopefully there's not too much noise because um, I've got my, my microphone, woohoo! Um, anywho, I figured I would uh, catch up on this if the voice recording of this doesn't work, then I'll just read it via video, cool. Okay, so um, last time we ended, um, we were reading Harry Potter, the beginning one, and the Sorcerer's Stone with Miss Yoon's class. Um, and we had just gotten to the end, almost the end of chapter one, where uh, we met our protagonist and a couple of other people, if anyone remembers, a couple of wizards. And um, unfortunately, we also discovered that Harry has been left on the doorstep of number four Privet Drive um, in, I believe, November. So kind of a cold, rainy, rainy month um, because something happened to his parents. So uh, anyone watching, write me a thing at the end of this and tell me um, what happened to Harry's parents and why is he being left on the doorstep of Four Privet Drive with his closest relatives. So his closest relatives happen to consist of Petunia Dursley, his aunt, uh, and his uncle, Vernon Dursley, and of course his cousin, Dudley Dursley, who's also about the same age as him. Um, and so, we also met Professor McGonagall, Professor Dumbledore, and of course, Hagrid. So, they put the Dumble, or excuse me, they put the bundle on the door step, took a letter out of his cloak, tucked it inside Harry's blankets, and then came back to the other two. For a full minute, all three of them stood and looked at the little bundle. Hagrid's shoulders shook. Professor McGonagall blinked furiously and the twinkling light that usually shone from Dumbledore's eyes seemed to have gone out. Well, said Dumbledore finally, that's that. We've no business staying here. We may as well go and join the celebrations. Yeah, said Hagrid in a very muffled voice. Oh, best get this bike right away. Good night, Professor McGonagall, Professor Dumbledore, sir. Wiping his streaming eyes on his jacket sleeve, Hagrid swung himself onto the motorcycle and kicked the engine into life. With a roar, it rose into the air and off into the night. Anybody else want a flying motorcycle besides me? I shall see you soon, I expect, Professor McGonagall, said Dumbledore, nodding to her. Professor McGonagall blew her nose in reply. Dumbledore turned and walked back down the street. On the corner, he stopped and took out the silver put outer. He clicked it once, and 12 balls of light sped back to their street lamps so that Privet Drive glowed suddenly orange and he could make out a tabby cat slinking around the corner at the other end of the street. He could just see the bundle of blankets on the step of number four. Good luck, Harry, he murmured. He turned on his heel and with a swish of his cloak, he was gone. A breeze ruffled the neat hedges of Privet Drive, which lay silent and tidy under the inky sky, the very last place you would expect astonishing things to happen. Harry Potter rolled over inside of his blankets without waking up. One small hand closed on the letter beside him, and he slept on, not knowing he was special. Not knowing he was famous. Not knowing he would be woken in a few hours' time by Mrs. Dursley's scream as she opened the front door to put out the milk bottles. Nor that he would spend the next few weeks being prodded and pinched by his cousin D Dudley. He couldn't know that at this very moment, people meeting in secret all over the country were holding up their glasses. And saying in hushed voices, to Harry Potter, the boy who lived. And that's the end of chapter one. Chapter two, which is called The Vanishing Glass. Vanishing Glass. 
Nearly 10 years had passed since the Dursleys had woken up to find their nephew on the front step, but Privet Drive had hardly changed at all. The sun rose on the same tidy front gardens and lit up the brass number four on the Dursleys' front door. It crept into their living room, which was almost exactly the same as it had been on the night when Mr. Dursley had seen that fateful news report about the owls. Only the photographs on the mantelpiece really showed how much time had passed. Ten years ago, there had been lots of pictures of what looked like a large pink beach ball wearing different colored bonnets. Bonnets are like hats, baby hats, you know, little... But Dudley Dursley was no longer a baby, and now the photographs showed a large blonde boy riding his first bicycle on a carousel at the fair playing a computer game with his father, being hugged and kissed by his mother. The room held no signs at all that another boy lived in the house too. That's weird. Yet Harry Potter was still there, asleep at the moment, but not for long. His Aunt Petunia was awake and it was her shrill voice that made the first noise of the day. Up, get up, now! Harry woke with a start. His aunt rapped on the door again. Up! She screeched. Harry heard her walking toward the kitchen and then the sound of the frying pan being put on the stove. He rolled onto his back and tried to remember the dream he had been having. It was a good one. It had been a good one. There had been a flying motorcycle in it. He had a funny feeling he'd had the same dream before. His aunt was back outside the door. Are you up yet? She demanded. Nearly, said Harry. Well, get a move on. I want you to look after the bacon, and don't you dare let it burn. I want everything perfect on Duddy's birthday. Harry groaned. Oh. What did you say? His aunt snapped through the door. Nothing, nothing. Dudley's birthday. Woo, how could he have forgotten? Harry got slowly out of bed and started looking for socks. He found a pair under his bed, and after pulling a spider off one of them, put them on. Harry was used to spiders because the cupboard under the stairs was full of them, and that was where he slept. Do any of you sleep in the cupboard under the stairs? It's a little weird, right? When he was dressed, he went down the hall into the kitchen. The table was almost hidden beneath all Dudley's birthday presents. It looked as though Dudley had gotten the new computer he wanted, not to mention the second television and the racing bike. Exactly why Dudley wanted a racing bike was a mystery to Harry, as Dudley was very fat and hated exercise, unless, of course, it involved punching somebody. Dudley's favorite punching bag was Harry, but he couldn't often catch him. Harry didn't look it, but he was very fast. Perhaps it had something to do with living in a dark cupboard, but Harry had always been small and skinny for his age. He looked even smaller and skinnier than he really was because all he had to wear were old clothes of Dudley's, and Dudley was about four times bigger than he was. Harry had a thin face, knobbly knees, black hair, and bright green eyes. He wore round glasses held together with a lot of scotch tape because of all the times Dudley had punched him on the nose. Not very nice, jeez. The only thing Harry liked about his own appearance was a very thin scar on his forehead that was shaped like a bolt of lightning. He had had it as long as he could remember and the first question he could ever remember asking his Aunt Petunia was how he had gotten it. In the car crash when your parents died, she'd said. And don't ask questions. Don't ask questions. That was the first rule for a quiet life with the Dursleys. Uncle Vernon entered the kitchen as Harry was turning over the bacon. Comb your hair, he barked by way of a morning greeting. I don't know, usually you just say, like, good morning or something like that, but comb your hair. About once a week, Uncle Vernon looked over the top of his newspaper and shouted at Harry that Harry needed a haircut. Harry must have had more haircuts than the rest of the boys in his class put together, but it 
made no difference. His hair simply grew that way, all over the place. Harry was frying eggs by the time Dudley arrived in the kitchen with his mother. Dudley looked a lot like Uncle Vernon. He had a large pink face, not much neck, small watery blue eyes, and thick blonde hair that lay smoothly on his thick, fat head. Aunt Petunia often said that Dudley looked like a baby angel. Harry often said that Dudley looked like a pig in a wig. Harry put the plates of bacon, egg and bacon on the table, which was difficult as there wasn't much room. Dudley, meanwhile, was counting presents. His face fell. 36, he said, looking up at his mother and father. That's two less than last year. How many presents do you guys get for your birthday? I get like, maybe two, maybe three. You get less as you get older. Darling, you haven't counted Auntie Marge's present. See, it's here under this big one from Mommy and Daddy. All right, 37 then, said Dudley, going red in the face. <sighs> Harry, who could see a huge Dudley tantrum coming on, began wolfing down his bacon as fast as possible in case Dudley turned the table over. Do you usually turn the table over when you don't get something you want, like a present? I sure hope not. Aunt Petunia obviously scented danger too because she said quickly, and we'll buy you another two presents while we're out today. How's that, Popkin? Two more presents. Is that all right? Dudley thought for a moment. It looked like hard work. Finally, he said slowly, so I'll have 30, 30, 39, sweetums, said Aunt Petunia. Oh, Dudley sat down heavily and grabbed the nearest parcel. All right, then. Uncle Vernon chuckled. Little Tyke wants his money's work, just like his father. a boy, Dudley, he ruffled Dudley's hair. At that moment, the telephone rang, and Aunt Petunia went to answer it while Harry and Uncle Vernon watched Dudley unwrap the racing bike, a video camera, a remote control airplane, 16, 16, new computer games, and a VCR. That'd be like a DVD player. He was ripping the paper off of a gold wristwatch when Aunt Petunia came back from the telephone looking both angry and worried. Bad news, Vernon, she said. Mrs. Fink's broken her leg. She can't take him. She jerked her head in Harry's direction. Dudley's mouth fell open in horror. But Harry's heart gave a leap. Every year on Dudley's birthday, his parents took him and a friend out for the day to adventure parks, hamburger restaurants, or the movies. That's a pretty deluxe birthday, don't you think? Every year, Harry was left behind with Mrs. Fig, a mad old lady who lived two streets away. Harry hated it there. The whole house smelled of cabbage, and Mrs. Fig made him look at photographs of all the cats she'd ever owned. <sighs> now what? said Aunt Petunia, looking furiously at Harry as though he'd planned this. Harry knew he ought to feel sorry that Mrs. Fink had broken her leg, but it wasn't easy when he reminded himself it would be a whole year before he had to look at Tibble's snowy Mr. Paws and Tufty again. <laughs> we could phone Marge, Uncle Vernon suggested. Don't be silly, Vernon, she hates the boy. The, Bur the Dursleys often spoke about Harry like this, as though he wasn't there, or rather, as though he was something very nasty that couldn't understand them, like a slug. Mmm, slugs. Gross. What, what about what's-her-name, your friend, Yvonne? Oh, whoop. That wasn't Aunt Petunia. That was Uncle Vernon. Sorry, give me a second. What about what's-her-name, your friend, Yvonne? On vacation in Mallorca, snapped Aunt Petunia. You could just leave me here, Harry put in hopefully. He'd be able to watch what he wanted on television <gasps> for a change and maybe even have a go at Dudley's computer. Aunt Petunia looked as though she'd swallowed a lemon. And come back to find the house in ruins, she snarled. I won't blow up the house, said Harry, but they weren't listening. 
suppose we could take him to the zoo, said Aunt Petunia slowly, and leave him in the car. That car's new. He's not sitting in it alone. Dudley began to cry loudly. In fact, he wasn't really crying. It had been years since he'd really cried. But he knew that if he screwed up his face and wailed, his mother would give him anything he wanted. <coughs> Nice kid, Dudley Dursley. Okay, guys, so we will find out what happens next time in Chapter 2 of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. We are on page 23 of the uh, Scholastic Press printing. And uh, see you later.